Greetings and welcome to another Studious Saturday edition. And what we're going to be talking about today is Michael Porter's Five Forces. This is probably one of the most common models that we look at in business, and it's applicable to not just business organizations, but any organization that wants to think about where it sits in the marketplace, wants to think about competitors, and maybe wants to even think about how technology is going to affect what they do in the future. So without any further ado, let's dive right in. As the name implies, there are five forces. Now, as we go through these slides, you might want to download my slide deck, which is in the comments below. You'll find a link so that you can download them. Or you might want to make a diagram, at least, that has five boxes or five circles or whatever you want to do so that you can take a few notes as we go throughout this. One thing I wanted to point out before we get started is that these five forces are not exclusive to each other. They interact. They interrelate with each other. So the increase in the power of one force might change the impact of another. But we're going to take each one of these forces one at a time, at least for now. So the first one is the threat of new entrants. So how easy is it for new entrants to enter a particular market? Is the entry barrier low? If so, then that means that other people can get into this market, can get into this area fairly easily. Therefore, the threat is high. If there are very high barriers to entry, meaning that it is very difficult to get into this area, to enter into a business that works in this area or an organization that works in this area, then the threat is very low. The incumbents are often asking themselves, what can we do to increase the barriers to entry? So how can we make it harder for people to enter our market? Startups are doing the opposite. They want to know, what can we do to lower the barriers to entry? What can we do to make sure that we can get into there much more easily? And it's very interesting to me because I'm a technologist and I'm very interested in how technology can shift these forces. And one of the big things that we find is that technology often lowers the barrier to entry. I'll give a couple of examples as we go throughout this, but I'll give you a very quick one right now. Think about cloud computing. Well, cloud computing allows you to access computing resources as though it was a utility. Well, you couldn't do that 10, 20 years ago. You couldn't start up your business without going out and buying those servers, buying that processing power. Today, you can buy it as a utility for relatively cheap. That lowers the barrier to entry for all sorts of businesses. Now, there's a number of things that affect this particular force. One is regulation as well as technology. Let's look at a number of industries where the threat of new entrants is relatively low because there is a high barrier to entry. Banking is a good example of an industry where the threat of new entrants is low. It's relatively hard to start a new bank. There is a high capital investment required to get a new bank started. Same thing with telecommunications. Lots and lots of equipment that has to be purchased, installed, and deployed before you can even get your first customer. Building a new hospital would require a huge amount of capital investment. A lot of money would have to be put in, once again, before you even see your first patient. And the same sort of thing goes for higher education. Starting a new college, starting a new university, where you're going to grant four-year degrees. You're going to need land, you're going to need buildings, you're going to need faculty. Even before you have your first student enrolled, you're going to have to make a huge capital investment. Now, all these industries that I've just used as examples have one thing in common. They are highly regulated. This is because we often see government stepping in to protect the consumer in a case where it's unlikely for there to be new entrants and there's unlikely to be much competition. 
So in a lot of states, you're going to find a public service commission that regulates telecommunications. You're going to have various state and federal agencies that are regulating banking, as well as health care and higher education. Let's look at a couple of industries where the threat of new entrants is high, meaning that the entry barriers are relatively low. Think about a lot of service businesses. If you have a lawnmower, you could get out there and start mowing lawns. What is it going to take? Well, it's probably going to take a small amount of insurance, filing a business license, just a few things there that you have to do before you can start your lawn mowing business. So it's going to be relatively easy for new entrants to get into this market. Likewise, restaurants are relatively easy to get started. You usually need some business license. You can have to have some inspections. You're going to have to probably get a loan to finance a lot of the equipment that you need, but it's relatively easy to get started. What about creatives? That's an area where the threat of new entrants is high. What is the barrier to entry to starting a YouTube channel? Well, you need a phone and a YouTube account, so it's not very high. Lots of people could get started in this area. Once again, there's a common theme. There's low regulatory hurdles or low regulatory pressures. The next force that we're going to look at is called buyer power. Now, when I talk about buyer power, I want you to think about this as customer power. So what is the power of the customer in the buying relationship? There's lots of things that influence the power of the buyer. Can they take their business elsewhere? Can they go without your product or substitute something else? Sellers in this relationship want to decrease the amount of power that the customer or the buyer has. So they might try to increase the exclusivity of their product. Patents are a good way to do that. So you might patent something so that you can be the only one that can offer it. That therefore, that decreases the buyer power, allows you to have greater margins and greater market share. You might also try to do some things to increase the switching costs. In other words, make it more painful for buyers to switch to one of your competitors. Now, what are some of the ways that you can increase your switching costs? Well, there's quite a number. One is that you can start a loyalty card program. So loyalty card programs keep customers coming back. So whether it's Starbucks, whether it's Subway, whether it's your American Airlines frequent flyer miles, you're going to tend to want to pick that vendor over other vendors just so that you can kind of keep going and get those extra benefits. Of course, nowadays with a lot of these loyalty cards being done through apps, such as the Starbucks app, they're able to track all sorts of analytics. So they can see that I'm a regular customer and then all of a sudden I stop coming in. So they can offer me special deals to lure me back in. But that's a whole nother video when we talk about frequency, uh, recency, and monetary value. Also, you might try to have some sort of technological lock-in. So in technology world, we sometimes call this the ecosystem. And this is probably most known with Apple products. So people say, well, I can't change from an iPhone to an Android device, or I can't change from my Mac to a PC because I'm locked into that ecosystem, the Apple ecosystem. And MKBHD has a good video I'll link here that talks about that ecosystem effect. You also might try to lock people into long-term contracts so that they don't go away or there's a penalty if they switch. We often see this in things such as satellite TV or cable TV where they're gonna try to give you a discount at the initial uh, part of your contract and then are going to up that switching cost if you switch, especially if you switch early. Also exclusive offers. So you're seeing this in the streaming wars that really started up again. Where can you watch The Mandalorian? Well, you can only watch it on Disney+. Plus. That's the only place you can get it. And so lots of people are going to that streaming service just for that one show. Of course, once you're there, hopefully you'll find other things of value and maybe you will also just keep going with it because it's too hard to figure out how to unsubscribe from it. 
Okay, so there's lots of different ways that our suppliers try to decrease that buying power. Let's take a look at supplier power next. And as you can imagine, supplier power is related to buyer power. If you're thinking in terms of being a supplier, you want to increase your supplier power by reducing buyer power that we just talked about. It's also great if you can be the only game in town. There's several examples of businesses or companies that try to be the only game in town. Think about different luxury brands. A Gucci, can you get Gucci any, from anywhere other than Gucci? No, you can't. So you have to go to Gucci. So they are the only ones in town, so to speak, that carry that particular brand. So one way that suppliers do increase their power is through that brand identity. There are also lots of examples where suppliers find that they have a lot of power because they are the only game in town. This is a very recent article that was from May of 2021, where some folks found out that Spectrum charged $30 for a 400 megabit connection on one street and $50 for half that speed on another. And it turns out that other street was where there was no competition. This is why some of these industries are regulated to prevent this type of price gouging. So there's other numerous examples of this. Apple is the exclusive provider of a product called the iPhone, but they're also the exclusive provider of a product called the App Store. And there's a lot of consternation, a lot of talk about Apple's dominance in this area and that you can't load apps from other places. And it'll be interesting to see what regulatory action is taken on this. Now, one of the things that I want you to realize when we talk about supplier power is that the supplier is selling to a buyer, but that buyer may then be in turn a supplier to another buyer. So this is a so-called value chain. And you think about it in supply chain as we have lots of different companies along the way that are adding value until you finally get to that end user. The next one I want to talk about is the threat of substitute products. So think about Coke. That's a drink. You could substitute water for it. You could substitute all sorts of different drinks for this sugary drink that may not be that great for you. So once again, we're looking at switching costs. If the switching costs are low, there's really not much cost to the consumer or to the end user if they drink some water rather than a Coke, well, then the threat is very high. Okay. If the switching costs are high, it is very painful to switch, then the threat of substitute products is low. Once again, going back to that example with Apple and Android, that you're kind of locked into the technology, you're locked into that ecosystem, it's difficult to go ahead and move all those apps, all those contact information, all that from one platform to another. Switching incentives, why might a customer switch? For lower cost, higher value, maybe convenience. You want to be in a market in which there are few substitutes for your products or services. If you are in a market where there are lots of substitutes, you're probably not going to have much of a margin. So once again, here's another example that's switching between the iPhone and an Android device that I already mentioned. I would say here, at least for me, the switching costs are pretty high. So the threat that I'm going to move away from my iPhone and go to an Android device is probably pretty low. The last one is rivalry amongst existing competitors. So what do people compete on? Are they competing on price? Are they competing on brand? Are they competing on quality? Think about different products where there is not a lot of differentiation. There's not a lot of difference between product A and product B. They're probably competing on price. So there's lots of different things that are going on here, but how much blood is in the water, so to speak, amongst the existing people in this marketplace? So now that you know what the five forces are, let's try to take these five forces and apply it to an industry. I'm gonna take higher education as an example. It's one 
that I'm very familiar with, but I think it's one that you're probably familiar with too, if not very directly as a student. So for higher education, if I was to do this analysis, here's how I might think about it. For the threat of new entrants, I would say for a typical higher education institution, it's relatively low. It's difficult to start new institutions and new programs. Certainly that happens, but there's all sorts of hurdles you have to go through. There's all sorts of capital investments you have to make in buildings or in faculty or in staff, even before you can enroll your first student. And there's also accreditation processes that you have to go through. So if you want to start a new program in nursing, you're going to have to get accredited or at least start that process before you can enroll students. Next, I would say the buyer power is relatively low. You don't have a lot of choice as an undergraduate student of where you're going to go because you have to go to an accredited institution. You cannot go to Prof C's YouTube channel university. Okay, I'd be happy to print you up a nice diploma for $300, but it's not going to cut it when it comes to applying for jobs. You have to go to an accredited institution. With that, I would say supplier power is relatively high. There's great brand association within different states with different institutions. You want to be a graduate from University of Wisconsin-Madison. You want to have that association. Um, these institutions also have the accreditation from the accrediting agencies, whether that's a specialized accreditation in a subject field or whether it's a general accreditation. It's also what employers want. They're going to want to see that four-year degree or that two-year degree, whatever type of job you're applying for, they want to see that degree from an accredited institution. Next, I would say the rivalry amongst existing competitors is high and certainly has become much, much higher in the last 20 years, 30 years, because of the Internet. And I would say we're about to undergo another wave of this as we're seeing online education really developing some roots in our culture, in our classes, in our mindset, but also is getting to be a much higher quality product. So I'd say online education is increasing and we're seeing institutions leverage that. For example, savvy institutions are using Coursera to find and recruit bright students. So they are having you take or letting you take a Coursera course. You get certified by that institution and uh, you receive a nice little certificate, but they're also using that to then recruit you into their programs. Those that are successful online, they might try to recruit you into either an online or face-to-face -face program. So I think that's going to continue to increase in the next five to ten years. And then finally, the threat of substitute products. Now normally I would say this is pretty low, but I would have to say it's been increasing. Google is now offering certificates that they treat the same as a four-year degree by Google. So in other words, if you were to apply to a job at Google and you had a certificate from Google in project management, they would consider that the same as getting a four-year degree as far as their requirements to apply for a job. So we'll see if this takes off, but I think the threat of substitute products, in other words, getting something other than a two or four-year degree at an accredited institution, may be starting to change. And it's once again where we start to see technology is changing these dynamics. Okay, so we're actually seeing the threat of substitute products increase because of the availability of these technologically de delivered uh, courses. Okay, so I think we're going to see more and more of that happening. Now, what I'd like to do is have you do a little homework. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and I want you to select a familiar company. I want you to develop an analysis based on the five forces model. Think about the threat of new entrants. Think about buyer power, supplier power, rivalry of firms, and substitute products. And post that analysis in the comments. I'll take a look at that. I'll provide you with some feedback and hopefully we'll get some good positive feedback 
from your colleagues that have made it this far into this video. Thank you for watching. If you watched all the way through this, let me know what you'd like to see on our next Studious Saturday. Mm -hmm.